So pleased to be joined by our next guest. He is 23 and 1 with 16 KOs and a leading middleweight contender. In fact, I believe is now officially in line to face Ryota Murata for the WBA middleweight title. He is St. Paul, Minnesota's Rob Bravo Brandt. Rob, thanks for joining us here on Boxcaster. Oh, it's great to be on, man. Like I said, I'm a huge fan of the show, so it's, uh, it's fun to be on. Oh, it's great to have you. We've been big fans of yours for a long time. Uh, now, the long career loss against Bramer, you rebounded from that. You beat Colby Corder. What was it like traveling overseas for fights? I know you have an extensive amateur career, so that in and of itself wasn't a big deal. But what was it like facing Bramer in Germany for the World Boxing Super Series? You know, it was a definitely it's, a, it's an experience that you, you can't buy. You know, it's a... Uh... It was, it was tough, you know, dealing with the first loss. But, you know, going overseas, it's a whole different uh, – I have a whole lot of respect for, for those who, who go overseas and, and to get their Ws and get their titles because it's, uh, it's tough. You know, you're dealing with uh, crowds that, that aren't necessarily uh, there to see you. You're, you're dealing with a complete change in, in your, you know, the time slot, of course. You know, it's uh, dealing with something seven hours before where you normally be competing and, and you know, just training and, and being in uh, somewhere else for so long. You know, it kind of – I'm not going to say it, it was the, the huge contributing factor in the loss, but it, a lot of everything, a lot of things that it tapped into it. You know, a lot of things that they kind of contributed toward, you know, overall uh, not coming out with the W. But uh, a lot of things, things with losses, though, is that it's uh, you can truly learn from them. You know, I used to always think it was a super cliche uh, saying, you know, you don't, you don't lose, you just learn. But uh, you really do figure a lot of things that you weren't doing that you need to be doing. And, and, and stuff like that. So I imagine you learned more from that one loss than you did most of the fights previous. I mean, you were on such a roll when you went into fight Bramer. I think you knocked out nine of ten opponents, and you know, you're, there was this big buzz brewing. But like you're mentioning before, I imagine there was more value in that one loss than there was in the nine ten wins, as far as you developing as a fighter. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, and that and it's it's good that it's with somebody who's at that top level like Bramer, though Bramer is toward the end of his, his career. You know, he showed a lot of uh, veteran tactics and things that you need to look out for. You know, I mean, these are these are things that if a young buck does those same things that Bramer does, those shots hurt a lot more. You know, you get in there with a Golovkin type and you have that same straight left hand that he, that he landed, you get hit by with the Golovkin type or even a Murata type in some situations. That's the end of a, that's the end of the competition. So there's a lot of learning to be done when you uh, when you think things like uh, like the loss. And Bramer, was a, he was kind of a strange guy because, yeah, he was the, the oldest member. He was the oldest entrant in that tournament, but he's also physically had to be the largest for sure. I mean, he's a monster of a man. He's sweating down to get to 168. You're coming up from 160. Did Was the size discrepancy a big factor for you? You know, honestly, I uh, the size I didn't even notice until we got in the ring. We're standing across from each other. Well, not necessarily in the ring, but, you know, when I was in Germany and, and ran into him at the, the open press conference, I was like, yeah, he's a lot bigger than, you know, what I had originally thought of in my head when I met him at the gala event and things like that. He was, he was a big guy, but he wasn't necessarily a devastating puncher. You know, I was, uh, I got out of there with uh, my, my full health intact and things like that. And like I said, it was, uh, I didn't get hit host, uh, so hard that I didn't remember, you know, the lessons that needed to be mm -hmm. learned. From the fight. So it was, it was a lesson. Was it a hard lesson? Looking back, uh, or yeah, you know, anytime there's going to be a loss involved, it's going to be a hard lesson. I'm a very competitive person, as is most people that are, you know, compete in the sport. You know, losing, uh, you don't, you forget how much you hate losing until, you know, unfortunately, it happens. So it was, it was tough to take, um, but also motivating in the same breath. You know, it's it's easy to take a loss like that and just realize and just put my foot down and say I'm just not at that level. You know, let me go back to the local Minnesota level. It's, it's an easy thing to do into opposed to look at it and be like, well, I lost, I hate it, but you know, there's, I was in this fight, you know, there, there's things I can do to correct where I can be the best. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint, so to speak. It, it wasn't so lopsided though, that you, you, you look back, you think this guy isn't world level yet. It was more like, you know, there's just, he's a young guy who's far better than being that regional fighter that just, you know, that was a huge step to take yes. world boxing super series new weight division against the guy that was much bigger going on the road. I mean, that is a huge, huge debut leap into the world stage. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm proud of a lot of things that I did do at that stage, but there's, there's so much more room, you know, there's so much more career left to go. I'm, I'm 27. So I'm just, you know, walking into my prime right now. 
so it's 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 time you know now it's uh with those lessons that i learned from bramer it's time to take those lessons and then let them flourish into a full-blown champion now i guess the next the next opportunity to show how you've grown is going to be overseas as well i imagine because I, I i can't imagine you're fighting ryuta Murata anywhere else other than japan uh i imagine you are better better prepared for that fight for that eventuality because of what you went through with bramer though yeah, absolutely absolutely you know this is uh it's time to get things done you know opposed to you know beforehand where you know now i know that not doing everything that i should be doing can result in a loss you know, when you're undefeated, it's like, well, you know, I can have a bad performance and, you know, barely equal weight majority decision or things like that. You know, you just never even cross it in your mind. Now, knowing that you're going over to someone else's backyard, it's going to be a lot more difficult. You can lose if you're not 100 percent. So now everything that I do is, is based to, to, to be 100 percent. I want to ask you, was you were on such a roll, as I mentioned before, before that Bramer fight, were things coming too easy for you? in the ring and that when you had a guy that was really more of a challenge than what you had faced before, you couldn't just get by on what you were doing to succeed on a regional level. There's definitely, I could see how it could, it could definitely look that way. And I could, in, in, in some ways, yes, that, that's correct. It's uh, when things come so easy, it's, it's tougher to grow. You know, that's uh, when you, when you're always hitting people and, and when things are happening, you can dictate what goes on. And, and when you're in the gym, yeah, it can be a lot more difficult. Um, but, uh, in terms of, uh, it having that effect, uh, yeah, it, it has a, a little bit of effect in terms of, you know, being on such a tear and, and, and winning and always having that in your head that doesn't matter what happens, I'm, I'm going to win. You know, I think that's kind of the, where the, the, the biggest discrepancy came in is that I always felt like no matter what happens, I'm going to win. I'm going to beat this person. So now I know that if I don't decide to wake up at, six o'clock in the morning, go run. And I don't do all the, all the miles in the do. I don't spar all the rounds. Yes, you can lose. That possibility is there. So I think that's the best thing. I, one of the biggest things that I came out with after that fight is, is it convinced me that you have to do the work. You have to put in the, the small things. You have to do the, all the little things as well as all the big things. Have you changed your approach as far as what you do in the ring uh, in the wake of the Bramer loss, or is it more of the preparation that you were mentioning? The, the, the preparation and also, yeah, absolutely, the, the, the way that I buy. I think that I, I was a little bit too much of a stationary target. Again, I, I, I just went out there thinking, you know, I had this newfound power in my pro career. Let me just go on a seek and destroy mission. And, and realistically, you know, the type of athlete that I am, I'm, I'm much more of a, you know, a boxer puncher type style where I'm going to be moving. I'm going to be throwing a lot of jabs and, and using speed opposed to trying to sit down, you know, working with, you know, I have so much admiration for Earl Spence Jr. for all the time that I, I spent working with him that uh, I almost uh, attempted to, to emulate my style after his, and, and not everybody is going to have that style, that, that kind of seek and destroy, sit on the inside and, and, and bang away. You know, I'm going to have to be a person that's going to have to be my back foot a little bit more, I have to box and, and utilize my power a little differently. So that's uh, a lot, lot, of, lot of learning, you know, a lot, lot of learning that what happened in between, you know, the Bramer fight now. Now, you've got Murata next, and of course, I'm talking to Rob Brandt. He's going to be facing Rita Murata sometime in the future because he's been mandated as the mandatory challenger for Murata's WBA title. Murata is an interesting cat because he he's extremely overlooked, I think, in the whole middleweight conversation. He's got, an, I think, an incredible skill set. Of course, he's got the one loss, disputed loss, but I think he's learned from that loss. I think he, he, he emerged from that loss a little bit. Uh, he's not quite as economical with his punches now as he was in that in that in that first in dam fight uh, what do you see when you see Rio de Murata right now well I think he definitely won both the fights against Mar uh, against Ndam. uh but what I look at he's a he's a very very powerful one-two puncher you know he he'll utilize a left hook to the body if you're a stationary target and you decide to shell up but he's uh he's extremely accurate straight shots not very creative but he is uh extremely talented you know you don't get an Olympic gold medal uh, for being mediocre. So that has to be looked into account when it comes into the, the training uh, for, for Murata himself. But I have a, a whole lot of respect for him as, a, as an athlete. But uh, again, I, I see a lot of uh, areas in which he, he's lacking in terms of his just overall uh, selection of punches that he, that he uses. You know, he, he's going to have a little bit of a tough time. He's he he was especially in the in damn loss extremely economical like he gave away a lot of rounds just because he just wasn't throwing as a fighter is that a sign that he's hardwired to do that or that um you know 
he just had an off night, do you think? You know, I think part of it can be the off night. I think a lot of it is the fact that when you're the best in Japan and the best in the area, especially the guy that size, when he goes into a sparring session in his home country of Japan, I'm going to say a lot of the guys he's in there with are going to be a little more apprehensive, a little scared of him. So if he's walking down with his hands, you know, with his, his earmuffs on and both of his hands up high and walking people down, they're not going to be quite as apt to, to attack him and, and attack those vulnerabilities because they know what's, what's across from them. Um, on the flip side of the coin, I come to places like the Mayweather gym or, or in the past working with Spence or Charlo, they, you know, they're there to be the best, just like you're there to be the best. You know, there's nobody who's apprehensive towards the person's skill across from them. So therefore it allows you to work at a little bit of a higher level, which is one thing I think that I'm going to, I've had much more of the edge since we've been pros opposed to the amateurs. The amateurs, he was probably consistently traveling, fighting the best in the world. He was, he was around all the time and he was always at that top level. Now in the pros, he mainly fights in Japan, fights guys that are very good, but seemingly tailor-made for his style. You know, if you're going to, you know, stand in front of him and, and just put a high guard on, yeah, I mean, nine times out of ten, he's going to knock that person out. So you get somebody who's going to be moving a little bit more boxing and, and giving them some resistance, similar to Endom in the first fight. I think that that's where you're going to see him hold on to his punches, hold on to his shots a lot more, and uh, kind of uh, watch himself give away rounds as it goes along. Talking to Rob Brandt. Now, Rob, the middleweight division is so deep right now. I, I mean, it, it could be from one to ten. You, you, might, you might have, out of the top ten, you might have nine guys that could beat on a good night the, any of the other guys. Definitely. In middleweight, I mean, obviously there there are some that stand out as as being better than some, but there's general parity in the top ten. Who, in your mind, is the best of the bunch? Um, I think Jacobs is probably the best uh, in, in the bunch. I think that uh, you know, of course, it can't be. I mean, I thought he had a great fight with Lovkin. I thought that Canelo is definitely in the mix, but I just feel that in terms of the the size, a real true middleweight, he's fast, he can punch hard. Uh, Jacobs is kind of. I would say he's the best uh, middleweight in the division. Um, I, I would say he, I also think he would have beaten Golovkin had it not been for the fact that he's just uh, plagued with inactivity, stretches of inactivity. Mm -hmm. You know, if you get a guy like that who's, you know, on, on his horse and he's moving and he's active, I think that he beats, you know, I think he beats the Canelo and, and Triple G. Is it tough, though, because he needed to be more of, a, uh, more of the boxer puncher than the puncher boxer that he naturally right. is. And when he, when he was able to be mobile, he really showed. But... How hard is it to change a guy that is so good at doing one particular thing and seems to be born to do one particular thing that he has to curtail that against a guy who might actually be a welcoming target to yes. be more elusive? I mean, that must be so difficult for a guy. And I'm sure it's something you've gone through as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been through something similar in terms of uh, I was always, you know, in the amateurs, I, I won a lot of national titles at light heavyweight. I was a smaller guy and I just, depended on speed and just kind of playing tag. You know, meanwhile, you go to the pros, you drop down in size, all of a sudden tag doesn't really get you quite as far. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you know, you're going to have to bite down a little bit more and, and throw those power shots and, and, and slightly change your style, but just make it a little bit more of a professional friendly style. Is that what cost, uh, is that what you think cost Jacobs in the, in the fight against Golovkin that he's just, he couldn't resist getting in there because mm -hmm. it's what he does as opposed to what he needed to do. I think he realized that uh, Golovkin couldn't hurt him the way he thought he could. You know, like he said, the the, the myths of the boogeyman weren't real. You know, so I think that once he realized that he could he could take a shot and fight with Golovkin, he thought that he was going to just bite down his mouthpiece and then you know get into a tussle and and, and land one of those victory punches. Um, I think if he would have stuck to the game plan, he probably would have beaten him the entire time through. But the knockdown, of course, had a, had a lot to do with it. Is Golovkin the fighter he once was? There seems to be a consensus that he's past his prime. When you look at him, do you see a, a faded fighter or do you see a guy who's still nearly okay. as good as he well, was? I don't, I don't see the same guy that you know we saw early. It was the same guy that fought like Rosado, per se. No, mm -hmm. I don't think. Do I feel like he's still one of the best in the world? A absolutely. You know, He doesn't need to have a lot of spray and a step for the style in which that he fights. So, I, no, do I, I think he takes a little bit more punches. He fights... In, in moments, maybe a little less hungry, but that doesn't take away from the fact that he it, it speaks volumes for where he has been at, even when he was in his prime, and how highly tattered he was. That even if he happened to fade 
a decent percentage from when I first started watching him to where he's now. He still is not, he's not getting beaten. He's mm -hmm. still beating all these guys. So he's got that, that, ult that ultimate equalizer. You know, he's got the power. It doesn't matter how much right somebody does in a fight. You know, if he happens to tap you with one of those hooks or one of those right hands in any round, that's, you know, play the school song, it's over. Uh, how does he do in the rematch? And who do you, th what was your impression of the first fight? I know it happened a while ago, but, you know, the rematch has basically been signed, so. I thought it was a really fun fight. I mean, I thought that uh, he, I thought Golovkin won it. Um, it was, it was close. I think that there, I think that Canelo probably will get the, the rematch, though. I feel that he's, again, judge the fact that he's been able to take the Golovkin shots. I think he will throw a few more punches with this, and he's got that youth behind him. He's going to be able to uh, have a little more in the tank later. Mm -hmm. I think that's going to be a deciding factor in the decision. Yeah, I think so too. Do you think it was a, a tale of two fights within the first fight, and that the second fight is just going to be a continuation of the second half of that first fight? Absolutely. Absolutely, that's exactly what I think is going to happen. You pick up right where they left off. I mean, there's going to be a couple of those feel-out rounds first uh, and really have respect for each other in the first maybe round, round and a half. And from that point, I think we're going to take it off right where we left off. When you watch a fight, I'm, I'm always interested in asking fighters this. When you watch a fight, how much of it do you detach at all from the fact that you could be in there with somebody? Be it, if you're watching a middleweight or anybody, are you able to watch it as a fan or are you always watching it as a fighter and noticing flaws and... and always taking mental notes or can you sit back and detach and get the popcorn out and just enjoy it like everyone else? I'm, I'm a boxing fan first. So, I mean, there's most of me, I can sit back and just kind of watch a fight and I'm, I'm, I'm interested. You know, I want to see these two guys fight without having to take it apart and saying, this person's no good. I wonder what I'm going to do against that person. I try not to do that because when it comes down to it, I, I love boxing. I love watching the sport. Um, but it's, it doesn't always work out perfectly. Of course, you know, when I'm sitting there watching, you know, Golovkin and Canelo, I'm looking at, you know, things that they're doing wrong just as much as things that they're doing right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, uh, it's, I have my fan goggles on, but the, but the brain behind those goggles is still the same. Interesting. Uh, what do you make of Billy Joe Saunders? Billy Joe Saunders, he's gotten better and better every time that I've seen him. I used to never have any, I was never a huge Billy Joe Saunders fan in terms of watching him fight. I kind of thought he was kind of a talented coward. Um, uh -huh. watch him in the Lemieux fight. I thought he looked amazing. You know, I think the, I would give him a chance against the, against, uh, Triple G or, uh, Canelo. Uh, I mean, I, I may not be a huge fan of his, of his antics, but mm -hmm. his body of work has speaking for itself, you know? And then apparently the word is they were extremely close to making, uh, Golovkin Sanders had Oscar not come up with the deal to rescue the rematch. It, it, yeah, it yeah been... they play that game with Saunders every every camp. I feel like yeah, you know? he's, so yeah, they, they dangle right. that fight in front of Saunders every time. Oh, you're right, man. Some guys just get kind of played. They're always like the insurance policy. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I mean, I'd be in fear to ever be a, a Saunders opponent when when these talks are happening. You know, you got to look at the Martin Murrays of the world, where it just you know, it always sounds good until he might get a whiff of that bigger paycheck, and then you might have to take a seat. And then you're taking a seat for nothing because that whiff just goes away. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, top rank used to do that with Umberto Soto all the time. They'd always dangle a Manny Pacquiao fight in front of them. <laughs> and it would always be like the next thing. If, if this fight doesn't happen, oh, for sure we're going to see Pacquiao Soto. And we never saw that fight. And he never got to that level he probably could have been just because yeah. he was being a, used as a pawn kind of and never utilized yep. as a potential star. That's right. Man, you got to realize sometimes the two fives make a 10 any day. So, I mean, if you're sitting there passing up fight, passing up fight, passing up fight, waiting for those big ones, I mean, sometimes these guys just got to get active and realize that the more you win, the more attention you're going to get from those upper echelon fighters. You know, like if Billy Joe Saunders just continues to beat everybody around the, the mandatories, the, you know, all of the uh, up and coming uh, young bucks coming, coming through the shoot. I mean, they're going to be calling out Saunders opposed to Saunders always having to chase them around. But, I mean, I, I can see where the frustration in wanting to fight the, the best one and fight the best. I understand it. It also shows the power of, of a world title belt. I mean, it's easy to dismiss it. However, it does give you leverage. I mean, would anybody be lining up to fight Billy Joe Saunders with his style if he didn't have the WBO belt around his waist? That's a really good point. I mean, I... I I fear that he never, I hope that he never loses that thing. He's going to be a very, he's going to be like the, the next Lara, you know, Lara of the, the weight class uh, underneath. 
You know, mm-hmm. nobody really wants to fight him. You know, the fight him if you have to. Fight him if he's a mandatory, but nobody really wants to. And, you know, Saunders could turn into a, to a guy like that pretty easily. So, I mean, the fact when he secured that belt and he's, he's doing, he's been, you know, I won't necessarily call it holding it hostage, but he's, uh, he's held it close to the chest since he's gotten it because that is that's his key to relevance. Although the Lemieux fight was an out and out risk going into it. I mean, yeah. people were thinking, okay, this is kind of 50, 50. It turned out to be 95, five, but yeah. going in, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of a coin coin flip. Yeah. I, I had, I had Saunders going into it. Um, I kind of figured that uh, Lemieux was going to be a little bit too one dimensional. Uh, Saunders, he's, I mean, he's, he's mobile. I mean, he can, he can move. Um, I thought it was going to be a much closer fight than what it was. I, I thought that he was going to run away to the decision, but I didn't think that uh, he was going to dismantle him the way he did. Was it a testament to Saunders or an indictment on Lemieux that it was so one-sided? I, w- I would say it's more of a, it's more of a testament to what uh, Saunders has been doing in his, in his trainer change. Uh, I think mm-hmm. that has a lot to do with it. I don't want to undercut Saunders and say that, you know, just because Lemieux was shot. Because Lemieux is a good fighter. You know, he's, even when he was young, younger, you know, he fought really similar to what you're looking at when he's fighting a Saunders type. Yeah. That, you know, that, that style um, takes longer for time to diminish. You know, it's not like a, a super speed style, an agile style that, that requires a whole lot of that, uh, a whole lot of quick movement at that first step. You know, he's a guy who's going to be plotting forward. So I think that it lasts a lot longer. And so when you look at the Lemieux that you saw against Saunders, it's, you know, generally the Lemieux you've been seeing for, you know, through his entire career. Mm-hmm. Maybe a little bit a little bit slower on the first step, but I think that Saunders just looked very good. Talking to Rob Bravo. Brant, uh, Rob, you mentioned uh, you're training with uh, Charlo. Uh, Jamel or Jamal? Uh, I, in the past, I was, I was, I was not for his last fight. Uh, fight and a half, but uh, last was Jamel. It was Jamel. Jamel, I believe, is still with uh, in Houston. He's still in Houston, yeah. Okay, tell me about Mel. Mel is uh, talking to him. They're, they're, they seem they're yes identical twins, but they separate very quickly as far as temperament. Because Mel <laughs> seems a hell of a lot more laid back, and Mel is a constant live wire. Is that the case with guys he's training with as well? You know, Mel, he's uh, he's he's actually a really really good guy. He just he's really wants the the validation that that I feel like he's earned you know he's a world champion him and his brother did you know they made history in, in both becoming uh identical twins and world champions in the same weight class so I think that he's just uh he's, he's, he's a high strong guy but I mean deep down he's a, he's a really good person you know he does uh he's, he's good to the people around him he's he's uh as high strong as he might be and one of them might be a little more relaxed one might be a little more strong, but they're both so the, the guard the guard is up though right I mean his guard is oh, up yes, but once it's down that's, that's the best way to put it. Um, how, his guard is constantly up. He's improved so much. I mean, yeah. he's oh, he was always a very good boxer, but the the wow factor just wasn't there. You kind of knew it was there, but it never really w- came to the forefront. Now, however, he you know you take away. I mean, the the fight, the recent fight against Trout was you know it's an odd style matchup, but he showed flashes of him being oh, yeah. great, especially with the early knockdown. How uh, how good can he be, and can he beat Jared Hurd? I think he can definitely beat Jared Hurd. Uh, Jared Hurd is he's going to be he's always tough because he's uh, he's going to lumber forward, doesn't care what you're going to land. He's going to you know kind of like a zombie. He's going to mm-hmm. continue to go forward no matter what hits him. <laughs> so uh, I think that it, with that kind of style allows you to get hit. So if Jamel's in the shape that I know that he's he's always in when he fights, then. Um, Calm down a little bit, maybe a little bit, a little bit more chill than he was in the beginning of the trout fight. You know, mm-hmm. if you if you relax and kind of let the fight settle into something else, I think that he'd be able to to I think easily beat her just off his skill set alone, being a being a young guy who who has all these athletic gifts. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time, Rob, and your insight. I mean, it, in, incredibly giving in, on on both regards. Let's keep in touch. Best of luck with uh, your training camp for. For Murata. Uh, and once you find out what's going on, let's talk again. Uh, and, negotiations now. I think they have 120 days from the 15th for us to uh, to, to make it happen. And they keep saying it's there. They want to get him a U.S. viewing, so they want to have it in Vegas. But you know, it sounds good. You know, you, I, I follow the champions belt. You know, I, I respect it, whether it's in 
Japan or if it's in uh, in Vegas, though. So you get 90 days or 120, 120 days? 120 from the 15th of this month. Okay. Yeah. Who's who's representing you? Um, I'm under uh, Great Home Promotion. Okay. So, so if they had their way, the fight would be where? See the the and this is all rumored from what I what I've heard. Obviously, this is what, what my promoters told me is they wanted to have Murata, um fight in ESPN in the United States in order to kind of give them a little bit more viewership mm-hmm. within the United States. Um, it sounds good. You know, they also told me in the World Boxing Super Series that there's a good chance we want to have some of these fights in the States. And considering that you're the American guy, well, yeah, it all sounds good. But uh-huh. when it comes down to it, I respect that the champion, you got to go take the champion's belt. So if they tell me you're going to be, you know, fighting in Tokyo, or you're going to be fighting in, in this portion or that portion of Japan, I'll understand completely. I mean, because once the belt's mine, I'm expecting people to come to mm-hmm. the belt. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, I respect the process. Oh, how cool would it be to have a title fight in St. Paul, Minnesota? Oh, yeah. Well, I, you know, that would be a, a little bit, uh, I mean, depending on, on the season. You know? Yes. <laughs> and the winter might be a little bit empty in there because people like to uh, well, they're snowed in. in a 40-degree uh, weather. <laughs> When's the last time there was a world title fight in Minnesota? I don't know if there has been. I know that we've had Caleb Truex. Of course, he fought... Um, he got he had the title. Yeah. Never fought in Minnesota with it. Will Grigsby uh, wow. lives in Minnesota. I don't think he ever Scott Ledoux. Fought for, yeah, I don't think he ever fought his title in uh in Minnesota. Just, I honestly I, I'd have to look into that, but I mean as far as I know, I know we've had champions. We've had two, three champions before out of Minnesota, but never uh fought for the title there. So that would definitely be monumental. I like that. Do do you think okay? One of the things that gets you hit, when you hit the pillow and the head hits the pillow, you're like, okay, world title fight, Minnesota. You know, what, what, like, what do you, what are the dreams? What are the ultimate dreams that you want to do? Like, tick off the bucket list. Oh, yeah. I think that, that uh, fighting for the world title, I mean, honestly, it, for so long, I've always, it's always been, you know, get a world title that never really, my imagination never really went to where it would be at, where the crowd is coming from. Yeah. You know, it's just always that moment where, you know, you realize you just won or you hear that the decision, you know, get called out. I've, I've imagined that so many times, but in terms of where it's been, I mean, I would love for it to be in Minnesota. It'd be, it'd be absolutely amazing. But of course, for the last few years, I've lived in Dallas, Texas. So that would be amazing too. Oh, and Errol's got his fight coming up on Saturday. Oh yeah, I'll be against there. Against Ocampo. Yeah, I'm on Friday and I, and I get to the fight on Saturday. Uh, so. Just judging by what I've seen from Ocampo, I, if they're going to put an over-under on this fight, I can't see it going more than three or four. Yeah, it'll be it'll be a fun card. It'll be it'll be fun to you know be in there, get the uh, get the atmosphere, mm-hmm. you know, have Spence in front of his home crowd. But in terms of us sweat under the brow, I don't think I'm going to get. I'm not going to be. I'm not going to be sweating it too much. No, no. He seems like a cool cat, Spence. Yeah, he is he's very, very calm, reserved guy. You know, he's total like, Texas. Like I know he was born in the Northeast, but he he's uh, yeah, he's, born. Yes. <laughs> yeah, he's he's he seems so Texas, like so yeah, like laid back and chill. Very, very good guy. You do as well, man. You were a total treat. I want to. I don't want to take up any more of your time. I know you've got uh, preparations to do, but thank you so much, Rob. Hey, Jason, I appreciate it. I'll be I'll be listening. In.